quickly in just the first 30 seconds or so of this first minute of Think You Know Wine. And we are going to get started in just a moment. Just a moment. Uh, we'll let a, let a few dozen more come in before we get going. But here we are, season nine of Think You Know Wine. Season nine of Think You Know Wine. We're really excited to be back. Sarah, David, John, how are you? Hey. Doing great. Living the great dream. Great to be back. Okay, Lee. Hey, and folks, don't forget to tell us where you're tuning in from. We always love to know where the Yeah, audience. we need to know that. Yeah, I'm assuming this evening we have participants possibly as far away as Latvia. Wouldn't that be right, John? <laughs> <laughs> we have some our friends around the world in various countries, including Latvia, that they do tune in. Including Latvia. Country. I think you know so, why, amazing as that seems. Can that we consider correct. this our holiday edition? At this time, yeah, yeah. A little, a little yeah. soon, but we're not doing another uh -huh. one in yeah. December, so we probably right. won't do another one before the end of the year, Sarah. So, yes, welcome to the holiday edition of Think You Know Why. And <laughs> the, first the, thing, of course, the first thing, of course, we want to know is what's in your glass, David. Will you start us off on that? I will. I have a lovely uh Sauvignon Blanc from Napa Valley, uh, just released today. It's in Ontario, it's a vintage's release day. Uh, we were busy tasting all day yesterday, some of us even this morning. Uh, great wines. Uh, this is the Inglenook uh, Sauvignon Blanc from Napa Valley. Some barrel age. It's really a classy wine. Nice. Okay. How about you, Sarah? What do you got going in the glass there? I've got something a little unusual. Here's an Appalachian that I even stumped some master sommeliers from California on. This is an AVA called uh, the high Antelope Valley of the California High Desert. And I actually brought this back. It's about an hour up into the Mojave Desert outside of Los Angeles. And I got there sort of by accident because there were, I was trying to get to Malibu, but there were fires at the time, which a number of years ago, which was very disappointing. So my only route was to go up into the Mojave Desert. And I discovered this AVA. Um, and this man at a road stop, I didn't have any service, I was lost. And it was sort of a Rockwell style painting, where this man with this neon sign that said open, um, I went in to this, I didn't realize it was a winery, but it was, and I met Ephraim Chavez, who is the owner of Chavez Winery. And um, he took me around to these vineyards that were all planted in 1978, way, way up there in the high California desert. And this is a Syrah from 2014 that I cracked open tonight to see how it was doing. Fantastic. Okay, just to let everybody know, before I ask John what's in his glass, it seems we had a minor, minor technical glitch right at the beginning on our chat being a little not functioning, but it is functioning now. So please, everyone, let us know where you're tuning in from so we can say a proper hello to you. Meanwhile, John, what's in your glass? I was wondering why everyone was so silent out there, but now <laughs> we understand. I'm wondering, Sarah, is that is that your desert island wine you got there in your glass? It's a desert wine. I don't know if it's my desert island wine. <laughs> But sorry, it's sorry, I couldn't resist that one. Hey everyone, friends, so lovely to be back in your living rooms and your kitchens, wherever you are. And here we are thinking we know wine again. We'll see very shortly. But in my glass, guys, I couldn't resist. We all got a bottle of, the, of this at the office. We collectively purchased a little bit of this Buchenhutzkluf Semillon from South Africa from French Hook, literally the French corner, a lovely little part of the Cape Winelands. So currently in, in classics, and I think we've all visited the estate at one point, but uh, what excites me about this wine is that it's from extremely old vines, actually the oldest Semillon vineyard in the Cape, as far as I understand it, planted in 1902. And there are a couple of recent parcels. I think the youngest one is 1946, but you get the picture. It's a certified heritage old vine site made by a gentleman named Mark Kent. And uh, for me, it's one of the great Southern Hemisphere Semillons actually one of the great white wines of the world period and it's and it's pretty inexpensive so uh yeah it's a great way to start off a chilly november night yeah hey, and, well, uh, and michele what is in your glass by the well, way before i tell you what's in my glass uh, the first question i have for you is that's a pretty bold move going to the beck and hoods 18 i hope you have a second bottle to fall back on later on in life <laughs> As luck would have it, Michael, I do indeed, yes. And by the way, I, if you're going to open it now, which I don't really recommend, be sure to uh, carafe it. Give it a little bit of splash because it needs some air. All right. So I have two in my glass as usual. The first is a little, little palate cleansing, or I should say refreshing and opening Moscato d'Asti. 
This is from uh, Coppo, which is in Canelli in Piemonte. Uh, winery run and winemaker is Luigi Coppo. Incredibly fascinating, fresh, just vitalizing stuff, revitalizing as well. And the other thing I have in my glass is something we tasted at the office yesterday, which is on the current vintages release. So I guess we can strike this one off of tonight's uh, Think You Know Wine list. Okay. <laughs> uh, this from Quailsgate is uh, the uh, Pinot Noir, which is the Stewart Family Reserve. And this great is just, just great wine. Cracker Pinot Noir. Really, really excited to be tasting it two nights in a row or two days in a row. So that's what's in my glass. And By I'm, the way, do those uh, sunglasses help you uh, see the wine better? Is there some yeah. sort of strategy behind that? I do. I think that the less you can see, the more you can focus on aromas and flavors. So that's really, <laughs> yeah. uh, to be honest with you, I'm a little, I'm a little eyeglasses challenged this at this very moment. And these happen to be the only functioning pair I have. It is the truth. <laughs> well, okay. very cool. Very cool. <laughs> All right, we're going to get started in just a moment with uh, what's in our glasses or what will be in our glasses. But first, a couple little tidbits, some news, some important things to stick into your calendars. On December 15th at 6 p.m., we'd love you to join Michael and I. We're going to do a Beaujolais Happy Hour, which is certainly one of the most convivial and fun wines on Planet Wine, made, of course, from the Gamay grape. And uh, for those of you who really want to join in and have the fun, we've got a special curated six-pack that we've all put together from a bunch of wines that were sent to the office. We selected, as we always do, our top six for this. So it's a six-pack, and they're all cruised. They're all from the top spots. In Northern Beaujolais, we've got some Chenas, we've got some Julienas, we've got some Brie and Cote de Brie. And get this, we have some Fleury in a can. Yes, in a That's can. Oh, so good. We're all, we're good all, I'm going to say a little skeptical when we saw these cans arrive, but uh, the juice inside is genuine. It's really, really tasty stuff. So uh, give, it a, give it a shot. And you know what? We could talk about sustainability and all sorts of other things. Uh, cans, believe it or not, are way more sustainable than glass bottles. So bonus points for those earth-friendly folk out there. Uh, and these have all been ordered directly from France. You won't find these with any importers. No LCBO shells will be carrying these wines. So if you want something exclusive for your friends, a little gift and a little holiday mealtime, a six-pack. These are obviously very versatile, food-friendly wines. So we highly encourage you to, uh, to join us. We'd love to see you on December 15th. We'll have a little, last little toast with some delicious um, Beaujolais. There we go. Can't wait. Yes. David, you got something for us as well? Yes, I do. But just a quick reminder for folks, uh, we are tasting these wines blind uh, and we want to encourage you not to make any mention whatsoever ever on the chat, uh, any kind of reference to what the wines are, because that will blow the whole thing. So uh, listen, I'm really excited. We, if you've been following WineLine, uh, you may have read, we just launched this article earlier this week uh, on Two Sisters Winery, uh, Niagara, uh, Niagara River area. And uh, we've put together a case of these wines. Uh, there's one six pack and there's one 12 pack with two bottles each. Um, I've been to Two Sisters a couple of times and I was interviewing um, winemaker Adam Pierce there last week, and he's doing some great work. Um, you know, it, it's a it's a very interesting winery. It's got a big footprint. It's, it's got a big restaurant. It's sort of an iconic architecture, but I'm really uh, chuffed by what's in the glass, uh, particularly in, the, in this Niagara River area. It's quite unique in Niagara, and no one has made wines quite from this little corner before to show what this area's got. So I encourage you to read the article, uh, buy the wines, have, take a visit. Great. And you know what, David, I think that um, we are about to get started now. So I wanted to go over with everybody the points and the scoring for this. So and this is important for all of you panelists as well, too. So pay attention. We will be scoring um, based on the grapes and varieties that you mentioned. So that will be three points. The country, region and appellation is worth four points. The vintage is worth two points. And if we're off by a year, that's just one point then. And the price is one point. So this is what we're going to be asking of all of you tonight. So how about we get started then? I think that we're going to take off David, Michael, and John, because I've got a wine to present to you are off the camera. They've got uh, their voms there, their files of misery, number one, that they're gonna place in their glasses. 
Excellent. Okay, now that they're gone, I can talk to you for just a few minutes about this wine that they're tasting right now. And we'll give them a few minutes to smell and taste the wine. So what I've chosen here, and, and as you know well, is a Chardonnay, and it's from Burgundy. And it's from southern Burgundy in the area of Puy Frise. So those of you who have it in your glasses right now might notice that this is a pretty rich Chardonnay. Now, I expect them to get Chardonnay right off the bat, but from where is going to be tricky. This, um, These wines tend, tend to have a little bit more viscosity to them, roundness, richness, a little bit more flavor, and they have a little bit of um, oak influence to them as well. So these are certain characteristics that you're, they're going to find. And you could find this in Niagara too. That could be a mistake that they make or other parts of the world, moderate climates, not hot, hot climates, but moderate climates. I love this one. It's made from um, 30 to 50 year old vines. So um, most of the, the, the vines were actually planted in 1978. A little hint about me, that's my birth year. So I wanted to, to showcase that one as well. Um, I love the fact that this wine has this really flinty minerality that to me screams burgundy. Um, it's not too high in alcohol. It's at 13.5%. It's just edging up there, but it's not 14 like you might find in California, even in the North Coast. So um, I wanted to start it with a nice, rich white on this chilly evening. Let's bring them all back and see what they have to say. We're getting them in shortly. All right. All right. Well, as they... There we go. All right, guys, have you had a minute to assess this wine? Is anyone feeling a little confident or? Yeah, feeling pretty confident. Okay. Very like it. All right, so we've got we've uh, got a vote of confidence there in the quality of the wine. Um, let's start off um, first impressions then with you, David. Can you can you give us some thoughts on this wine? Well, I'm I'm really impressed with the quality, so I'm I'm having a little bit of trouble on price because very often, you know, we're we're finding some really good wines at low prices. So I'm not I'm not pegged on the price yet. But anyway, it's a it's really elegant. Um, it's got really good acidity, um, and and very very complex. Nice long finish to it. It's it's a pretty classy example of what I'm pretty sure it is. But who knows? Mm. Really like it. Good choice. Okay, excellent. Thank you, David. So well, let's move on to Michael's thoughts then. Uh, I'm confounded right from the beginning here, Sarah, of course, as always, but um, I agree with David, some good acidity here, really classic. I get this lemon zest kind of orange rind kind of kind of situation going on, uh, but also those white or yellow flowers that you get from certain varieties to do things like this. My immediate impression is it's got to be Italian, got to be Italian, got to be Italian, mm -hmm. but there's some other things happening in here, almost this kind of musty not must but musky clay almost m4 but far away from the skin contact and you know orange style but there's something about the vessels that this was in that you know maybe it's just concrete but it, there's something about this that uh is really unique to me and i have two specific ideas in mind okay so winemaking has an influence here in this wine yeah. all yeah. right john over to you then well many thanks to david and, and michael for revealing almost nothing about what yeah, that's, the, that's the point. About yeah. <laughs> well done. Well done. Uh, what to say about this wine, uh, other than the quality is great. I mean, I noticed a little bit of saffron floral right off the top. I thought maybe a hint of botrytis. I'm looking at the color. It's uh, not a pale, pale wine. So there's a little bit of age or maybe this late harvest style because there's a bit of a green tinge to it as well. So this medium straw plus green plus high acid, but also opulent and rich texture. It's all pointing in a sort of late harvest direction without any sugar. Don't get me wrong. This is a, this is a fully dry wine, but there's that little little hint of uh, of slightly overripe uh, character there. I love the yellow flesh orchard fruit. And as for uh, varieties and region, well, we shall see. <laughs> all right. OK, so you've all revealed just very small amounts to each <laughs> other. I'm not being very generous with each other here, but let's see what you have to say in terms of your final answer. Remember, grape, uh, country, region, appellation, vintage, and price. Let's 
Let's start with you then, David. Okay, well, going first means it's all about throwing everyone else off, right? So okay. um, I actually struggled. Again, we didn't have a lot of time to assess this one. I would have liked a bit more. Um, I, I was not getting a lot of no's right off the bat. I said, oh boy, we're going to have trouble with this. But I got it on the, like, the variety, I think, on the back palette. Sort of, it sort of came to me in a flash of, of what it is. And now you guys have got me thinking otherwise. But I'm going to stick with uh, my first impression. Uh, I think this is a very finely made Chardonnay. Uh, uh, there is a little bit of oak, but but not a lot, and and uh, I think that's what's making me feel a little bit less confident in, in my answer. Uh, it's it's not not a highly toasty, spicy Chardonnay by any means, and if there is oak, it's it's really well played, but it, it is giving it some of that texture that I really love. Um, and uh, the acid, I run right away. It's cool climate, so it's you know it's either Burgundy. Uh, or uh, or Niagara, uh, and I kind of just thought I felt uh, I, I knew, sorry, I recognized some Niagara influence in here. So I'm going to go with the Niagara Chardonnay. Uh, it's um, it's got a little age on it, partially from barrel. I'm going to say it's 2019, which was a really good uh, sort of high acid uh, vintage in Niagara. It makes some beautiful wines from Chardonnay and Pinot Noir and Cab Franc. So I'm going to go 2019. Uh, and uh, sort of Niagara, obviously, I'm going to focus in on Niagara Escarpment. It's probably one of the two uh, benches, either 20 Mile or Bemisville. If I had to say one, I'm going to say 20 Mile. And uh, the price, this is, again, I, I having some trouble with this. It tastes like about a $50, $60 wine, but sometimes you can get them cheaper and, and have this quality from Niagara. You know, Chardonnay is fantastic in, in Niagara. Um, so I'm going, to, I'm going to sort of land at about play in the middle here and go about $35 on this. All right. Thank you, David. All right. So let's move on then to Michael. Okay. Well, uh, I'm going to admit that there were moments when I considered Chardonnay both old world and new world here. Um, but there are two things about it that, that, that changed that for me. One is the sort of alluding to what John said, which is the slightly late harvest idea. And the other is this, is this concrete feeling that, that, very few winemakers I know would age Chardonnay like this. So uh, I actually think it's old world. I think it's Chenin Blanc. I think it's from France, from the Loire Valley. Um, I actually think there is a little bit of residual sugar in it, in it, not a lot. And I think that's sort of the thing that leads us to thinking it's a little bit late harvest, but I don't think it's so very late harvest. So it's a dry table wine still. But anyway, Chenin, France, Loire, I'm going to say it's $22. I think it's a great value, Chenin. Um, and I'm going to say it's from the 2020 vintage. All right. Thank you very much, Michael. And finally, John. Well, we're uh, covering some ground here. I mean, my thoughts initially were, were Pinot Gris, possibly Chardonnay, Chenin Blanc, all kind of swarm in that spectrum of flavors. But for me, it was that slightly late harvest, perhaps a little bit of Botrytis. That led me eventually to where Michael ended up there with uh, Shannon from the Loire Valley. And that's that's where I'm going to end up. So Shannon Blanc from the Loire Valley. Uh, Appalachian, let's call it Anjou. Bouvray Sec, no, Anjou. And uh, vintage, warmish vintage in the Loire 2020 price. You can get some pretty sharp values from the Loire these days. So I'm going to go with 24.95. All go. right. I think we have are all locked in now. Gentlemen, you all describe the wine very, very well. Um, and here is what it is. So this is Domaine Les Vieux Murs Pouilly. Puis, sorry, Puy, wow. Puy, Puy say from 2020 here. And the price is actually $33.95. Um, so yeah, this was, uh, I guess, a little bit more of a tricky Chardonnay than yeah, I had anticipated. It it's funny because I was actually looking for a good Chenin Blanc for this particular episode, but I couldn't find them in the quantities at, at the LCBO. So um, you were thinking on the same wavelengths and, and David, you nailed it with the Chardonnay here. Um, so 2020, I think some of you got that vintage as well here and um, that minerality, that freshness, um, I think that you all describe that quite aptly. 
quite striking the lack of wood or the lack of obvious yeah. wood. Sure there yeah. is, but it yeah. must be all old barrel in this case. Do you know the, the aging regime on this, uh, Sarah? I know that I don't know the exact percentage of older barrels, but there's not a lot of new barrel in here, right? It's no. mainly older barrel. It's really nicely integrated. I think it kept a lot of the the primary perfume in this wine, and um, it's it's just delicate and that oak aging. I also think that for those of you who probably had it in your fridge for a while too, it really brings out that acid. It tones down the richness because as it's been sitting in my glass, it really becomes just a little bit more opulent than it was at the onset. I remember when we were tasting this wine, this was on the November 5th or release, I think, or mm -hmm. October 22nd. Mm -hmm. And I, I remember thinking like, where's the oak? I mean, this is, this is Puy Fuise, and, and it really behaves like Puy Fuise, but I just, I just couldn't find much oak. And I thought that, that was really cool because there's, it's not simple wine. I mean, it's still very complex and a really long finish on it. Mm -hmm. Nice choice. Great oh, choice. Thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. That's a little curveball to start us off. Okay. And it looks like, da da da, of course, I have nothing on this. David. We're just ahead of you, Sarah. <laughs> You're hard behind. Oh, yeah. <laughs> we just um, squeezed ahead of you. <laughs> and uh, David is, is the winner here, very, very close behind John and Michael. Okay. So, um, I'm up next with my wine, but I, I, we want everyone to know that we're doing this totally by the book. So if everyone could open your vial of misery and pour it into your glass. Uh, we have not tasted these wines before, haven't seen them. Uh, this is our very first encounter. Okay. If you could. Put them all in the critics' lounge, please, and I will tell the folks about this wine. See you shortly. Okay, have fun. So um, this is, uh, for those of you who don't have it, uh, this is a Valpolicella uh, from Veneto region of Italy, uh, light-bodied, uh, very fresh wine. And I tell you, I'm, I'm really liking this style of wine, finding more and more good examples around the world. It's a basic Valpolicella, it's not a Ripasso, and I like that about this wine. I find Ripasso has more body and richness, but I find them really muddled and sometimes a little bit too sweet and just not, not quite um, as pure as I want. But this is a lovely pure Valpolicella, absolutely classic. It's obviously very young, that's, that's the whole point. Uh, Varieties Corvina, which is the main one in, in the area. So I've been paying a lot of attention to Valpolicella and its neighboring appellation called Bartolino. I like drinking these wines very simply. I had a, a beautiful Valpolicella in a restaurant to, a couple of nights ago um, in the junction area of Toronto, and it was inexpensive and just, just hit the spot with the pizza. So uh, it's an everyday wine. And, you know, Valpolicella has, is, is improving. The winemaking is getting better. The viticulture is getting better. They're not treating it as a simple sort of cast off easy, inexpensive red wine anymore. They're actually starting to get some real charm to them. So I, I don't expect the critics will have a terribly difficult time with this. I really just want to show the wine. It was actually one of my, my very favorites on the, uh, on the last release. So those of you who have it, I hope you're enjoying it, maybe with a light chill. And um, let's see what they might have to say. Okay, everyone back. Uh, Sarah, could you unmute, please? Done. Good, all right. Was that long enough, guys, just for, for reference? Oh yeah, plenty of time. Uh, plenty of time, you good, okay. Recognition. Okay, all right, so uh, let's just go around the, the clock here and get and first impressions on the wine without revealing very much. Uh, Sarah, what do you think? All right. Well, I think I love the, the peppery character right off the bat on the nose. It's so beautifully aromatic here. And I think it gives a bit away the, those aromatic, that aromatic profile. I love that this is refreshing as well, too. I love this is a refreshing red that you can maybe chill a little bit, too. Um, the tannins aren't very very high here. They're pretty supple. So all of those is giving are giving me some clues as to what and where this could be from. Okay. Johnny. 
I, I can see you had some fun picking this wine, David. <laughs> this I did. Is, <laughs> <laughs> is it a bit of a curveball or is it? I don't know. We'll see. I mean, as, as Sarah said, uh, immediately right off the top, this was just peppery, juicy, lovely, crunchy, fresh, kind of wild strawberry, wild herb, a little bit savage red wine, light tannins, but there's still a little bit of grip there. There's still a little bit of tack on the palate. For me, maybe a little bit of stem inclusion, which is to say you take the whole bunches and you throw them into the vat and then you get a little bit of that that fine tannin from the stems as well as the skins potentially obviously I, I don't know that I don't I don't see any wood here at all to speak of if it's there it's all old it's not contributing any flavor for me this is the type of wine that you um, you serve with a nice little chill and you crack it open on the patio or the terrace or with uh, you know a, a loin of tuna that you've just put on the grill or roasted that sounds meat. good and uh, and you have some fun with that good okay Michael yeah, I, I don't. I don't even think I have anything to add. They've said everything I've been thinking. I, mm -hmm. I can tell you what I wrote down: juicy aromatics, kind of these red roses, fresh herbs, um, maybe a bit of toast or tar or char, but nothing burning or warm or hot about it. It's just juicy and fresh. That light peppery, almost white peppery kind of kind of feel to right. it. So, to me, this is a. I don't want to use the word entry level, but I think that, that this is a this is a a wine estate using a grape that they use in many iterations. And in this particular iteration, the purpose is drink it, enjoy it, go for it, because we don't get any astringency from tannin. We don't get any, there's no demand or tension, real tension from this wine, but you know that this grape can do that as well. That's, that's where I would go with this. Okay, good observations. So let's uh, nail it, Sarah. Here we go. So I think right off the bat, I was thinking Gamay. And um, I was thinking Gamay because of that peppery character, the low tannins, the freshness of this wine. And I thought Niagara actually right away. Um, there was something about the, the acid profile that led me there, but also the aromatic profile that sort of lightly reduced a reductive character that I uh, picked up on the nose. Um, and I really like this wine. Um, it's, it's highly gulpable. So Niagara, uh, Gamay, and I think the vintage is relatively recent because Gamay is like that you want to drink it yep. fresh. So I would say um, 2020 Niagara Gamay, and the price on this one, um, I would say it's about $24. Okay. All right. I think if I were in your shoes, I would have much said the same thing. Okay, John. <laughs> Uh, I'm going to go in a slightly different direction, although Gamay is a perfectly logical, plausible, and perhaps even correct conclusion. But uh, for me, this uh, this takes me to the Southern Hemisphere, to South America, to Chile, a grape variety called Pais, which is the original mission grape. It was the first grape widely planted throughout the Americas, from California all the way down to, to Southern Chile. And we've uh, had a couple that have come through the market recently that really fit this, this mold for me. They're meant to be these juicy, joyful wines. So uh, Pais from Chile, from Itata specifically, which is this region about 500 kilometers south of Santiago. And the wines here are pretty well priced. I'm going to go 1995, uh, even in the case of really old vines, which they have a bunch of down there. So how's that for a totally outlandish and way out there? No, that doesn't seem to be too out there. I mean, those wines are becoming very, very popular. You know, at the Chilean wine fair, they had a couple just last week and they were just like this and, and delicious. So, all right, Michael. Very interesting choices. <laughs> and I, I don't think it's Gamay, although there's nothing that tells me it, it shouldn't be Gamay. Um, and same thing with Pais. There's nothing that tells me it shouldn't be Pais, but I cannot shake the unmistakable feeling that this is an Italian wine. So what I think it is, is I think it's Nebbiolo. I think it's a, as I said, an entry level version of Nebbiolo, um, you know, not in the Barolo or Barbaresco vein, obviously, but I think it's a Lange Italian Nebbiolo um, from a producer that makes some pretty serious Barolo, I would guess, because as I said, I think this grape can do both. So I'm going to say, yes, Nebbiolo, Italy, Lange, 2020, and I'm going to say it's $28. Okay, uh, just before I do the reveal, I actually have to put the wine in the bag. Uh, John, we need to get a, I believe, a vintage date from you. Was it the vintage we needed from John? Yeah, I missed the vintage, uh, and I'm going to go 2020, please, and thank you. Okay. Okay, well, here we go. 
It's Val Policella, isn't it? It is. <laughs> Val Policella. It is. Dang. Yeah. Lovely little wine. We all had it just a couple of weeks ago. Had it, Sarah, it was one of your favorites, Sarah. Mm -hmm. It was. It definitely yeah. was. I love the snow. Yeah. It's great. But as I said, when you know, when you guys were in, in the critics' lounge, I mean, it's just got this lovely vibrancy and freshness that, uh, and so glad to see it in, in a basic Valpolicella, which is so inexpensive. It's really yeah. lovely. Uh, at least I, I was know. in the right country. <laughs> yep. Yeah, it's Michael, nice you got the good. Uh, not far away. Style. Coming back because Ripasso is is the big category in Valpolicella. It's it's the number one selling category, probably just ahead of Amarone. So these light, classically styled Valpolicella wines kind of got forgotten in the last 20, 30 years. And they've made a little bit of a comeback in the last five years. I think um, the world is once again ready for these juicy, light, fresh wines that the Veneto does so well. And Valpolicella in particular with these varieties, Corvina, Corvinone, et cetera. Yeah, yeah you know, and, and the profile of being low tannin high acid there are a lot of you know gamay for example a lot of the wines that you were talking about all had that kind of profile but you're right very stylish this wine very and that's it is. and i'm going to get to enjoy a whole lot of valpolicella next year i'm for two weeks i'm leading a tour with canada's great kitchen party we're going to be stationed in verona and doing valpolicellas and amarones and proseccos mm. and suaves and veganas can't can't wait okay how do we do here Okay. It's tight. It's anyone's it game. <laughs> We're killing it. Just when we thought we knew wine. Here we go. This has been a great humbling uh, reintroduction to our show here. Well, I think it's my turn, folks. It sure is. Yeah, I think it's hopefully, my turn uh, to, take over, to take over the nest and send you away. And let's see those bombs in front of you. Number three, right? <laughs> Number three. Number three. Uh, okay. What could go we'll wrong? See how, we'll see how kind Gadella was to you on this particular evening. Good Please. luck. Good <laughs> luck. Yeah. Come back in a few minutes. Okay, everyone, let's see uh, what wine I chose. As you can see, I have chosen a Cabernet Franc from the Loire Valley in France. Uh, we tasted this a few weeks ago at the office from the November 5th Vintages release, and I just loved how juicy and, and simple and easy drinking this was at the price. Uh, there, there, there may be some who get it, there may be some who don't, and that reason would be that uh, there's a, there was some discussion when we tasted it together as to whether this was authentic or really a classic Cabernet Franc from the Loire, meaning it's not overly herbaceous, it's not overly uh, tannic, um, it's just juicy and fresh and fun. So um, some felt it was it was a perfect rendition and some felt otherwise. I personally loved it. I think part of the reason it being a couple of years older, being a 2018, it had settled a bit and really just kind of you know settled into its skin. So it's a beautifully, a lovely drinking wine. Uh, I actually think at least one of our critics are going to get this wine. I, I didn't feel like picking something so esoteric. This is something that everybody is very, very used to and very confident with, I would think. But um, we'll see if they if they recognize it as being the great value wine that it is at 1895. So Samuel Champigny, and here they come. Welcome back, everyone. Make sure you unmute, please. And we're going to get started with John off the top and see what his first impressions are. Oh, professore. That was a, a short little green room you gave us there. It was, yeah. <laughs> but, you know, but, uh, but sufficient, perhaps. Uh, again, lovely wine. You can, you can tell uh, where we're all going with our red wine drinking these days towards these later fresher styles. We're also excited about them. This is one of those, although a degree more serious, I would say, than the, than the previous one there. For me, this wonderful floral right off the top, also a little gravelly in the sense that uh, I really quite enjoy. Fruit is, is clearly very ripe, I'm guessing ripe vintage. Uh, but then also underneath that is a little bit of a sort of a roasted vegetal character that brings me to a particular uh, family of varieties, potential regions, and, and so on. And, uh, you know, 
good concentration, drinking really well now, probably not fresh out of the vat, not 10 years old, somewhere kind of midway at a perfect drinking curve, drinking evolution. So a nice choice. Thank you. I think you've nailed it. That's it. <laughs> we'll give the round to you right now, John. You've nailed it. Okay. How about you, Sarah? How do you feel about this one? You know, right off the bat, I was thinking this is a blend rather than a single variety. That was one um, cue. I had a lot of this dried herb spiciness um, come across on the nose and on the palate. I do think it had some ripeness to the tannins. It didn't feel mouth drying. My gums weren't hurting. This was a, a wine that had some suppleness about its tannins. I think they're voluminous tannins, but they're not astringent tannins um, to this wine, but they're definitely there. And um, I love the the either the use of wood or very little wood here because it doesn't seem to me to be a full on oaky wine. If there's oak, which I think there is, it's supportive and not demonstrative. Sounds good to me. OK, John, sorry. Step aside. There are two of you who have pretty much nailed it so far. So <laughs> let's see if David can get in on the action. David, what do you say? Well, first of all, my, my impression is I really love the aromatics of this wine. Um, and by the way, using a, my Salto wine glass, it really helps uh, boost those things. Uh, but it, it's got this lovely sort of red fruit, all kinds of herbs, spices. It's very complex. It's generous. Um, and, and I just want to sit and smell this wine. Obviously, a bit more body than the, than the Val Policella had. It's got some tannin. It's got some weight. I agree that the oak is really, really well handled here, if, again, if at all. I mean, it, it, there, there's no heavy vanilla or resin or spice or toast. It's just, it really is all about the grape uh, in this wine, and it's fresh and delicious. Excellent. Excellent. Okay. Circling back, John, you're up. You've got to lock it in. Tell us, what do you got in your glass? Uh, listen, this is my last go around. So my last opportunity to score some points. I can't play any poker here and mislead my, my colleagues. So I'm just going to have to lay it on the table and tell you what I really think it is, as opposed to what I've been doing so far, which is just kind of misleading. Uh, tell me what you want. Tell me what you really want. <laughs> I believe this is uh, made from the Cabernet Franc variety. I believe this is old world. I believe this is from France, from the heartland, Loire Valley. Where in the Loire Valley, we could go to Chinon, we could go to Bourgogne, we could go to Saumur Champigny. I'm going to stay in that latter part, so a little bit further west along the Loire River. Lots of limestone, lots of chalk, and warm vintage, as I said, lots of ripeness here. That would take me to 2018. And uh, value here, as we know, is, is rampant. It's everywhere. Wines like this you can get for $18.95. Okay, well done, John. Sarah? Where are you going with this? Yeah, so I'm going to Bordeaux, actually. I'm going to stay in France. I, to I totally think that this could be a Cabernet Franc, especially given that aromatic profile. I think there is Cabernet Franc in here, um, for sure. But I think it's from the right bank of Bordeaux. I think that there's some Cab Franc. There's some Merlot here, given that plush richness on, on the palate. Um, I think it is huh, 2019, 2020. This is the tricky thing, but I think I will say 2019, Bordeaux, um, right bank, uh, probably Cote de Bordeaux, and um, uh, price, price on this one. Ooh, I think that there's some good concentration. Boy, you can find some nicely concentrated wines here. I'm going to stay at the $25 price point here. 25 Okay, good job, Sarah. Thank you. David, you're up. Okay, well, I was going somewhere far away from, from France uh, on this, uh, but I think, uh, and, and it's been continuing to taste the wine, not just listen to you guys, but continuing to taste the wine. I, I think you're right on the variety with, with Cab Franc uh, or being probably dominant or Merlot. Um, and uh, I, I, I think it is more Bordeaux than it is Loire. Uh, I, I don't think it, it could be Niagara, but not I'm not quite there uh, on Niagara. I think they'd be a little bit heavier somehow. Uh, so, yeah, I'm, I'm going to kind of follow along with Sarah here and go to Bordeaux, uh, right bank. It's, it's young, it's fresh, uh, 2019. Again, it's the lack of oak that's really um, got me concerned here <laughs> about my guess at Bordeaux. Mm -hmm. 
but um, so I'll, I'll do that. And again, it's it's inexpensive. There's lots of delicious, lighter, fresher uh, Bordeaux in the market at you know from eighteen to twenty five dollars. So I'm going to say twenty two, and and leave it at that. And uh, once I find out, I'll I'll tell you what my original guess was. Okay, what was the glass you said you were using there, David? The Zalto. Zalto. For those of you who are asking about that, Zalto, Z-A-L-T-O. Fantastic glass. Beautiful glass. Yep. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, here's the reveal, everyone. <gasps> the Back. Yeah, Samuel Champigny. Where to go, John? Where to go, John? Cabernet Franc from Loire Valley, Samuel Champigny. John nailed it. 2018 Cabernet Franc. And it's interesting, John, because when I before I brought you all back here on this, I said to the to the audience, there are some who may not think it, they're probably going to get close on this one, but they may find it too joyous and too juicy and too yeah. fresh and not herbaceous enough to really know where it's from. But uh, yeah. you were able to see through uh, that. Well to done. be fair, we, uh, I mean, we've tasted these all of these wines pretty recently. And this one mm -hmm. I recall tasting pretty vividly in the office and thinking this is rather ripe for Loire Valley Cabernet Franc. Right. 2018 makes perfect sense. And you asked me uh, what I thought of the wine. I thought this is pretty, pretty terrific wine. So yeah, when I guessed that, I, I knew exactly what I was guessing. It was it was kind of my Hail Mary last little toss there to, to grab some points before it's too late. But I mean, this is the sort of quality of, of Cabernet Franc coming out of the Loire as climate warms inexorably, inevitably. We know that uh, the styles are going to get a little bit richer, richer and riper, and this fits perfectly. But it's but for me, it's classic, classic Cab Franc. It's got all of the violet perfume and that that lovely little herb i'm not going to call it green it's not green any longer it's just you know herbal and fresh and sort of minty in the back end hangs on nicely exactly true so there we go thank you scoring wizard john you, you have moved well into the lead david you're in a solid second place sarah and i we got have some work to do in this last round but john i just want to ask you one last question before we turn it over to you and that is that is would you say that moving west along the river, like you mentioned early on about Samuel Champigny, that things get a little a little warmer and a little juicier in the wines as a result? Would you think? Mm, no. No. No, hard to say. Hard, <laughs> I mean, hard to say. Usually, I mean, as you move closer towards the Atlantic, you've got this massive body of pretty cold water right next to you. What grows at the at the furthest west end is Muscadet. There's no or very little red uh, varieties grown out there. It's white wine country. And Saumur is, is the furthest west you go for red wines in the Loire. So, I mean, it's a little bit more continental inland, but I can't, you know. I've had this discussion many times. Can you tell Chinon from Bourgueil and Saint Nicolas and Saumur Champigny? And the ultimate answer is really difficult. It's easier to tell the producer often than it is mm -hmm. the actual appellation. Would that Very it were simple. Yeah, would that it were. Thank you very much. I think that was just something I thought maybe our audience would like to know. You know, how do you how do you kind of disseminate the Loire Valley red red wine appellations? And that's uh, I think you're right, producer. You have, you have to start with producer more than anything. Okay, John, I think it's over to you. Terrific. All right, friends, let's see your number four. Freshly cracked, all in all. All right, see you, see you in a bit. Oh, okay. Now we're going to have a little bit of fun here. Can we flash that wine up there, Brian? All right. So this is maybe a little bit mean of me. I'm going to confess here. This is not a classic regional variety combination. We're drinking Grenache from Chile, from the Maipo Valley, from a producer that is very familiar to all of us here in Ontario. Perez Cruz has been around. It's been a generalist for the Cabernet Sauvignon for as long as I can remember, at least uh, 20 years. And this is an estate that, that's been around for more than 20 years uh, in this classic location in Maipo in the Andean foothills, so a little bit inland, south of Santiago, of course, and uh, Perez Cruz, a nice little operation, quite large, but doing a really, really bang up job and making wines at reasonable prices. So if you haven't tried their Cabernet Sauvignon, which would be surprising if you drank any Cabernet Sauvignon from Chile in the last 20 years, it was very likely the one that Perez Cruz makes. It's reasonably priced, I think, in and around this range, maybe a little bit less, $15.95. That's their bread and butter. But this is a wine that they've recently 
introduced into their range. In fact, this is the only the second vintage they've produced. But uh, even down in Chile, we're dealing with a Mediterranean and warming climate. So varieties like Grenache, like Morvedra, like even Malbec make perfect sense in this part of the world. And producers thinking forward, thinking into the future, wanting to capture this market for lighter style reds are opting for varieties that are really well suited for the climate as it as it changes and, and, and adapts. So um, Grenache, do I expect them to get the variety possibly just based on the color alone? Look at that lovely pale red, slightly garnet color. It's a thin skin variety. It never yields a lot of uh, depth of color. And then on the nose, it's all it's all red fruit. There's little wood here to speak of. It's designed for early consumption. But uh, other than that, it's going to be tough to guess. It's going to be tough to guess, full stop. I mean, we've tasted this all quite recently, and I wanted to include this because uh, for me, Chile is a very dynamic country. Certainly uh, in South America, it's uh, it's really pushing the envelope in terms of style and um, and varieties and exploring different regions. And well, who knows what they'll guess. Let's let's have a look. So uh, can we bring back our illustrious critics? There they are. All right, friends, having fun, huh? Was that a nice little taste fun. again? To the, uh, John, you must have had a lot to say about that wine. That was a long rest in the room there. <laughs> well, you know, I wanted to give you a little extra time on this one, just so it didn't look like I was uh, trying to stack the odds in anyone's favor. But there we go. You've had some time. You've worked it through. Yeah. Who has not gone first yet? Uh, Michele, I believe. Uh, let's uh, let's turn it over to uh, Dr. Sunglasses. Uh, you, you've been working on your curveball, haven't you? <laughs> that one was a spinner. Okay, so uh, juicy, fresh. And I mean, the the, uh, the thematic tonight is pretty bloody yeah. obvious. I think <laughs> you know uh, you know no discernible oak. Maybe a combination of stainless steel and a little bit of uh, concrete. There seems to be a lot of concrete in my in my nose. This evening, for some reason, even in the white wine, uh, just juicy. I think I know what grape variety this is, or maybe slight blend. Um, where it's from, don't really know, but I there's an unmistakable feeling of a grape that um, sometimes really old vines make very fresh and very amazing wines. So, uh, or this could be young vines. Who knows? Who's to say? But uh, I'm loving this this choice, John. I'm loving this choice. I just wish my vom was was a little bit bigger for the rest of the night. Well done. That was a magnificently set of hedged bets right there. Now, <laughs> one amongst the other. So we're all good. Uh, David, over to you. What do we think? Well, my very first impression was, wow, this is good. <laughs> uh, I, I, I really liked it. I'm, st I'm still have not settled on the grape variety, just so you know. So it's going to be a bit of a a flyer when I actually have to try and nail this thing, but um, it's it's again beautiful aromatics, uh, all these lovely sort of red fr red fruit salad, you know, of cranberry, strawberry, raspberry, sour cherry, all those things. Herbs, again, oak, way understated. Um, and I, you know, it, it led me right away to one grape, and it still could be depending on where it's from. Uh, but there's this, there, there's vibrancy, but there's also some warmth and, and generosity to this wine. It's really throwing me. I still, I'm not, I haven't, can't even decide what climate it's from. Uh, so well done as a stumper, John. Uh, <laughs> but the wine's really good. Vibrancy, yet warmth and generosity. I think those are words of wisdom right there. Okay, Sarah <laughs> D'Amato. Well, John, I love this wine, first of all, and I want to use this descriptor that I really hate using because it bothers me a lot, but sometimes it's the only word, but it's really crushable. Like it's really juicy, salty, crunchy, um, very gulpable. This is a wine that um, follows that exact theme. So could it be volcanic? Well, I think that in that... <laughs> <laughs> and that I'm laying it all out here for my last one to let you know my thought process. But yes, I almost I went there. I went Southern Italian and um, and and uh, there was this character about it aromatically that really spoke to me that way. But then I thought about the red fruit and the amount of red fruit and the slight amount of warmth on the back end. And that led me to think of a grape variety like Grenache, maybe. So there's a lot of things that are really out there here. But it was also juicy and fresh. Grenache can appear juicy. 
because it's got a lot of red fruit, even though it's generally low in acid but and low in tannins. So, you know, it, it's tricky that way, that variety. And I think, Michael, when you're talking about old vines, that's what you were getting. Um, but there you go I'm, I'm at my most there together. On the last wine yeah well there we yeah, have it there. Sarah mentioned mentioned the variety by name there it was it was mentioned let's see where the rest of our our tasters take us so are we ready to lock it down Michele ready. yeah let's I'm ready well, Sarah's correct uh, how this could not be Grenache would be beyond me my first thought, as Sarah alluded to just now, would be Garnacha, not Grenache, meaning somewhere in Spain, Aragon, even Catalonia, but more Aragon was kind of in my in my wheelhouse on this, where I was mentioning old vines that can make these very inexpensive wines. But I think there's just a little twist here that John has in this choice. I think there's a little bit of that, that kind of eucalyptus almost note. It's really underneath, which takes me to a southern hemisphere. So I am going to go to Chile. And I'm going to say this is Grenache from Chile from the Maipo Valley um, 2020. And I think it is 15.95 and bloody delicious at that price or any price for that matter. Bold statements, bold statements from Godello. Okay. Well, David, is that a road you want to go down? Yeah, because I know how I know the wine Michael is talking about, and I know how much John loves this wine. Um, so that would be a reason for him to include it. I mean, there's not it's not just about what's in the glass; it's what's outside the glass too. Hello, I'm going to just stick with my first impression on this. Um, and uh, again, I was having trouble with the variety. I, Pinot Noir crossed my mind, but again, it was a little bit too ripe for the, for Pinot. Um, I think it's Italian. Uh, I'm going to go to Sicily, actually, to a grape called Nerilla Mascalese, which is grown on Mount Etna and um, makes these lovely, fresh, vibrant wines with a little bit of minerality and character to them. So um, that's where I'm going to land. Um, price, uh, well, for, first, sorry, first of all, vintage, it's, it's youthful, it's, it's fresh, to, uh, maybe 2020, about 28, now I'm going to say $30, sort of hedge my bets. And Appalachian for the record? Oh, yeah, well, Etna Rosso. Etna Rosso, okay. Another call for volcanic, Sarah. Oh, well, you guys both got my extremes here. And I, I, um, I'm with you there. I, I, you know, this Perez Cruz um, Grenache was awesome. It was so, so good. I, abs I absolutely adored it and it was 15 bucks and it was just delicious. Um, I had, I felt though, this just had a little bit more depth and I was feeling that volcanic mineral saltiness and close to the sea, um, character that I just couldn't get past. And so I, I, I have to go in the end with Sicily and, uh, Nevrello Mascalesi and maybe Net Naroso and, in the 30, $34 and the price, the, the vintage 2020. Can you give me a slightly more specific price? Did I say 34? $34. Okay, $34. $34. And 2020 vintage, yes? Mm-hmm. Etna Rosso. Okay. All bets are in. Thank you, team. You've done me proud. Those were terrific guesses. Oh. It is volcanic. <laughs> Uh-oh. Oh, you have a fancy yeah. bag. The grape variety is, is slightly improperly named, in, in my opinion. I mean, it really should be Garnacha, but it isn't. It is indeed Michael Goodell, the ah. Gar Grenache, as they call it, even though it's a Spanish speaking country, they go with the, the French nomenclature given their long history with uh, Bordeaux. And I believe and the scoring wizard will put this up, I think it's 1795. Uh, so we're all in that same price range there. But uh, yes, this is Maipo Andes, and the Andes is a, a, a hypervolcanic active chain of mountains that runs uh, pretty much along the western edge of the Americas. 
and uh, made by this company. I was I was telling the audience before uh, you came back on that this is a, the second vintage that Paris Cruz has made of this Grenache, a recent edition. Their mainstream is is Cabernet Sauvignon. We've known that wine forever, but this is a great little addition, a sensible addition in terms of variety, and the style really fits the the zeitgeist of of the modern times. So so Michael, how did how did, how did you get there? I got there, A, because right off the top, the second I opened the, the vom and put it in, Grenache just came flying out of the glass for me. And I remember this wine being, despite it being Chilean, almost always Chilean wines almost say Chile before they say anything else. And this was one of the re most recent wines we've tasted where the, where the grape variety came out faster than anything. So I just couldn't shake that. And after I listened to Sarah and David say, say Sicily and Etna Rosso, I was like, Oh no, it's totally <laughs> up. So, but but I kept my confidence just a little bit, just a little bit, just so you know. That's how hard it is to do this particular exercise, right? You can second guess and double guess over and over. But um, there's just that Grenache and that a little bit of Chilean note underneath it, and which is why I didn't go to Spain and I didn't go to Australia or anywhere else where Grenache is just just, just beautifully grown and made. Good for you, Michael. Uh, I, mean, I mean, the reason I didn't go Grenache, and I totally get Grenache on the nose, but most Grenaches or Garnaches uh, are a little bit thicker and softer, right? And and richer. Like this has got this vibrancy and, and edge and minerality that that really makes it work. Um, and and I was so that minerality kind of just led me to uh, to, to Sicily. But you know, Paris Cruz is this this wonderful small, re relatively small estate wine in the Andean foothills great sort of mineral structure in the in the vineyards uh and doing some really fine work and and they've actually uh, on the release today there's a cab franc from the same house oh, and a petite for dough that's just delicious and uh read the newsletter coming out early next week on this release because both of those are going to be featured by me and you know it's been a while since i've been to chile but one of the things i noticed especially with paris Cruz, is that there's an underlying vein of minerality and all these and, and and acidity in all of these wines that is surprising you don't find that kind of acidity in grenache from southern france you don't find it um maybe in parts of of spain but really that's that's quite distinctively yeah, they're Chilean. pretty high altitude but, yeah, and it's not a variety that you would expect to find, you'd expect to see from Chile in our market. But 20 years ago, this wine couldn't have existed. A, there wasn't much Grenache planted, if any at all, but B, this was not the philosophy of the industry to make wines in this style, in this fresher style, in this less oak style, in this less ripe style. It's, somebody pointed out have it that it's only 13.5% alcohol, which for Grenache is quite low, especially in a, in a country where you could ripen right. it to... 14 and a half, 15 without any trouble. So this is a purposely fresher, more minerally crunchy style that really matches, as I was saying, the, the style of wine that people want to drink. And that's what makes me excited about Chile. There's more and more wines like this coming out every day. So there we have it. Where where do we all lie? Oh, Oof. oh close. tomato. Through in the end. Wow. Wow. In the final stretch with a big 10 points there, comes in at 16. We have a winner, ladies and gentlemen. What's Thank happening? The, 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 the wizards are moving on behind the screen. I mean, all, the, all kinds of things happening. Well, well done, everyone. Well done. We, uh, we picked well done, the guys. pace as we went. Good wines. OK, yeah. so the big question is, what are your dinner plans? <laughs> and with what wine? Well, I'm I'm going back to my uh, my uh, Napa Valley uh, Sauvignon Blanc Semillon barrel aged, really rich wine. I'm uh, making uh, my COVID project was to join Good Food, uh, and I've really enjoyed uh, sort of getting into some more detail of cooking in the last two years. So I'm going to have a chicken and almond Spanish style salad tonight. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. How about you, Sarah? What's well, I'm going to a dinner party tonight, so it's all a mystery. The, the what should I bring is the question. So I'm actually bringing a sparkling wine from um, from uh, from Finger Lakes in New York. Excellent. It goes with everything. Pretty versatile. Yeah, you know, if I had, if I had thought ahead cleverly, uh, I would have prepared. I think for this wine because I've got the full bottle. So thank you very much. 
wine and I crew, but I would have had this probably with a, an oven roasted salmon with a little bit of sumac, just to bring in some of the flavors of fall there, you know, sumac with this lovely citrusy sort of character, rhubarb notes, I think would match really beautifully with this lighter style, fresh Grenache. So uh, no, other than that, I'm going to have some, uh, some udon, little Japanese style noodle uh, dish, which this will probably actually go well with as well. So okay, good. Well I'm uh, coming back to Sarah's pick because I uh, I have to get Shannon versus Chardonnay again. We seem to have to do often in our world. But David, I think there's a question out there. Considering this style of Chardonnay, uh, have you tasted many in Ontario that kind of compare to this, this style? Oh, absolutely. I mean, it was very interesting. I was just at a tasting of Le Closure Down, which is one mm. of the great sort of single estate Chardonnays and Pinots made in Niagara. And at the tasting, uh, Thomas Batchelder was leading it, and uh, he put a Puy Fuisse in from Burgundy to be kind of in the same park as, as what he's doing with, uh, with Chardonnay on the bench. So yeah, uh, and Puy Fuisse is actually probably my favorite style of Burgundy. It's the most expensive of the Macons, uh, but way less than the Merceaux and Chassins and Poulinis. Uh, and I, I just love the delicacy and elegance, and I'm finding that same character now in a lot of uh, Niagara uh, Chardonnays. Right. Well, last night I made a whole roast chicken, but I couldn't decide what to make, so I also made a four-pound rib roast. And we were only four people for dinner last night. So as you can tell, I have major amount of leftover, which I'm going to repurpose in some way, both both things. But I'm looking forward to the leftover chicken uh, with this with this wine for sure. I don't know if anybody has any left in their vom, but but um, well, I know Sarah, you do because you have a whole bottle. But it's <laughs> changed to me over the course of this hour. It is it has really kind of developed some flesh and some more ripeness somehow has come out of it. So. I, I love that uh, that Chardonnay can do that as well, not just red wines, but Chardonnay can do that and it can morph and it can change and there's more substance to it now. And I mean, obviously it's a it's not an ines, inexpensive wine, but it's really showing some some flesh now, which I love. Yeah, I do too. yeah it's it's interesting to see that, you know, we we do tend to think of ourselves as Burgundian style wines here in Niagara because of some of the producers that lead us in that direction, but also our natural gifts in Niagara, which are high acid, but a little bit warmer than most people think. So we can get that flesh. So I, I thought that was a great question, by the way, that was uh, asked to David. And, and thanks for pointing that out, Michael. Great. Okay, well, we're um, going to say goodbye to everybody. I think we're going to come back, reconvene probably in second Saturday in January. Is everybody available for that? What do you think? Let us know if you'd like to have another Happy hour, cocktail hour, blind tasting session with us. We love doing these. These are these are great fun, humiliating as they occasionally are. But you know, it's not about that. It's about the learning. It's about the journey. It's about drinking some wines together, virtually, but together. Absolutely. And, and we may have a guest, uh, a guest panelist uh, at our next uh, thinking of wine as well. It's going to be very, very interesting. We'll be uh, lots of to have someone else, some new blood. Yes, and a, yes. And a really um, exciting sommelier hopefully fingers crossed not for sure next time but i think we will um ontario's best sommelier will be joining us in the next few episodes of so you think you know why okay oh we have one more question first though john maybe you can answer it someone wants to know what what someone someone wants to know what you mean we mean by crunchy when we taste a wine oh like imagine biting into a fresh piece of fruit a fresh apple a fresh red apple you get the crunch you get the acid you get the freshness you get the vibrancy there's nothing mushy there's nothing soft about the fruit or the wine in this case it just makes you salivate it makes you happy wonderful perfect okay everyone thank you so much for a great time i love thanks it. everyone glad you joined us hope oh, you enjoyed thank everybody Cheers, everyone have a terrific evening enjoy night. until next time <laughs>